Hi guys, welcome back to Sea to Summit Medicine. This is a four part series going over a couple of wilderness medicine topics that are also applicable to a global medicine setting. Today we're gonna to be talking about diving medicine in particular. Uh, my name is Alexander Hetrick. I'm a fourth year at Rocky Vista University. Uh, I have uh, training and certification in advanced wilderness life support through the University of Utah, as well as backpacking medicine. And all of this information is coming from the Auerbach uh, Wilderness Medicine uh, textbook, as well as the updated 2020 Advanced Wilderness Life Support Manual from University of Utah. So with that said, let's go ahead and jump right on in. So this video lecture uh, covers diving medicine, which if you are part of the global medicine track at Rocky Vista University, uh, this is uh, a topic that is quite applicable to you uh, because a lot of the destinations you would be going to for your global outreach are uh, in tropical areas uh, where uh, diving recreation is super common. Uh, also, free diving among locals uh, is common as well. And some of these uh, injuries uh, you can see in the local population coming into your clinic as well. So what we are reviewing today includes the type, different types of diving and the equipment used, uh, the physics behind diving, uh, different kinds of barotrauma, trauma, uh, ocular issues, arterial gas embolisms, decompression sickness, and, uh, and nitrogen and oxygen toxicity. So it's going to be uh, covering quite a lot of stuff. So we're going to start off with the different types of diving. Uh, the one that most people uh, think about when they think about diving is uh, the recreational scuba diving. So scuba is self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. Um, it is a singular tank uh, carried on the back uh, and you have a two valve system uh, providing uh, air pressurized to the uh, uh, level of uh, compression the, diving it, the diver is under at their uh, depth. Uh, the other types of diving include uh, breath hold or free diving. This is super common among local populations uh, or uh, recreational um, uh, divers who don't like using equipment in which uh, they do breath holding techniques and try to extend the amount of time they spend underwater to dive to the seabed. Um, this is also uh, something we covered in our last lecture about drowning medicine is um, uh, these uh, free divers often try to hyperventilate to increase their uh, onboard oxygen, but it also decreases their onboard uh, carbon uh, dioxide as well, which decreases the uh, respiratory drive. And so you can actually get what's called free water blackouts um, in these free divers in which they black out while underwater and end up drowning. So that's something to consider. Uh, another type of diving is using the rebreathing closed circuit uh, diving apparatus. So basically you have two tanks and you're recycling uh, uh, the diver's exhaled breath, it removes the carbon dioxide and replenishes the oxygen to give the uh, air back to the diver so they can breathe it once again. So these apparatuses allow you to dive for extended periods, but they're extremely expensive and they are most common uh, uh, use uh, by the military and also underwater uh, welders and the, those kind of uh, technological fields. Um, the last one is supplied uh, surface diving. Um, and basically it's uh, that uh, iconic image you see in the old uh, tiny uh, divers uh, films where they have a, a big uh, helmet on that has the round glass in the front and then there's a line going up from their helmet to the top. So basically what th is happening is uh, gas is pumped from hoses on the surface uh, to the submerged diver at a pressure equal to the ambient water pressure they're at. Um, so uh, they can stay underwater for extended periods so long as the tanks up top, which can hold quite a bit more than what you can hold on your back, um, uh, can allow you to dive. It's also uh, quite common in the um, underwater welding in industry and other industries such as that. So uh, we're mainly going to talk about scuba diving, um, the uh, self-contained apparatus, which is the singular tank on the back, or double tank uh, if you want to go for extended periods. Um, because this is the most common uh, type of diving equipment you'll see used recreationally by uh, any of your patients. So uh, with this equipment, uh, the basics of it is you have a tank and you have a two valve system, the first valve, uh, takes the pressure from the tank, usually around 150 ATM, down to about 30 ATM. And then uh, the second valve regulates what ATM you're breathing at. Um, so that can be either uh, regulated electronically or it can be uh, self-regulated with some of the older devices um, in which that you can uh, uh, 
and maintain uh, the atmospheric pressure of your dive depth so you're breathing in that same pressure. And we'll go over why that's important here in a second. But to go over some more of the physics of diving so you can, can un understand why you have to worry about atmospheres and, and dive depth and all of that, um, Basically, uh, increased pressure while diving is the cause of all uh, medical problems with divers. Um, as you dive deeper, uh, the pressure around you increases. So you can think of it as rather than being surrounded by water, you can think of it as the water on top of you being a jug. You're holding that jug on top of your head. And as you dive deeper, there's more water in that jug and there's more weight pressing down over you. So that's kind of how you can think about the increase of uh, uh, pressure around you uh, causing um, these problems. It's, it's easier to think of as a tank of top, on top of your head and you're adding more and more water the, the further you dive down deep. Um, so that's what's called uh, hydrostatic pressure. So the surrounding water, hydrostatic pressure, as you dive deeper, the more water weight is above you and and increasing this pressure. The weight of the atmospheric pressure is uh, how much the atmosphere uh, weighs above you. So that's the weight of the air above you. So if, if you were standing on a beach and again, you put a column above your head and just said, hey, uh, all of the air in this column all the way up to the stratosphere has a certain amount of weight and it's putting a certain amount of weight on you. That's uh, how you can think of atmospheric pressure. And atmospheric pressure at sea level is one ATM. So um, the way you can think of the, the pressure while you're diving is it's a combination of the atmospheric pressure. If you're uh, diving at sea, sea level, that's just going to be one atmosphere. So that's kind of easy peasy way to think of it. But if you're diving up in the mountains or something, it won't be one atmosphere. It'll, it'll be uh, quite a lot less because you're higher up. Um, and we can kind of go over that more in a little bit. As you're diving, the, uh, the, uh, pressure of the hydrostatic pressure around you increases one atmosphere or 14.7 psi for every 10 meters or 33 feet you uh, dive down. The absolute pressure, ATA, is the sum of the hydrostatic pressure, which is read by the uh, pressure gauge uh, on your diving equipment, and you add that to the atmospheric pressure um, of where you, uh, uh, you started diving. So if you started diving at sea level, you add one ATM. If you started diving up in the mountains at a lake or something, you would add a different amount for the ab absolute pressure. But that's just kind of give you an idea that when you're looking at your gauge as you're diving down, um, whatever your gauge says, you need to add uh, one ATM, again, if you're in the ocean or something, one ATM uh, for, uh, for that uh, base atmosphere of the atmospheric pressure to give an accurate um, an accurate absolute pressure. So we kind of went over this just a second ago. Uh, the higher altitudes above you have a lower pressure because there's less air above you. Think of it as weight above you. Less air above you because you're higher up uh, means you have a lower pressure. More air above you, you have a greater pressure above you. So at sea level, the the max uh, level you can get for that atmospheric pressure is one ATM at sea level when you uh, cross from uh, uh, the land ocean. Okay. Now, as we enter the water, uh, we start increasing our uh, pressure as we dive every 10 meters or 33 feet. So uh, at sea surface, you're going to have a uh, absolute pressure of one ATM. This is because you have uh, the atmospheric pressure of one ATM and the hydrostatic pressure of zero ATM because you're at the surface. Then as you're diving down, you're increasing the atmospheric pressure of the uh, hydrostatic water around you uh, and you're increasing as you dive down every 10 meters. Now, why is this important? Well, there's two uh, things to note. One is that uh, Fluid or tissue is not compressible. That's kind of easy way to think about it. Is any kind of uh, fluid or solid surface is not going to be compressible in the water. So any of your body, uh, like your uh, blood vessels and that sort of thing, that's not going to compress anything water filled. But air is compressible uh, the further you dive down. So any kind of air filled sacs, which include not only your lungs, but also your sinuses, your eustachian tubes, your trachea, uh, your gastrointestinal tract, anywhere there is air fluid uh, sacs, that air is compressible. Um, and as you dive further and further down, that air is going to continue to be compressed. And then 
uh, to take that even further, what's most comp what is compressible in that air are those gas bubbles. So whatever makes up the air you're breathing in, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, all of that, all of those air bu bubbles are compressible uh, and they're uh, it, they, they differ in how much uh, compressibility they have. Uh, nitrogen uh, is the one we're going to be talking about the most just because that is the most compressible. Um, and it can go from a very large bubble to a very small bubble the d deeper you dive down. Uh, this image is just kind of reiterating that here at sea level, you have a gas uh, bubble volume of 100%. But as you dive down further and further, 10 meters, it's down to 50%, 20 meters down to 33%, and further and further and further, depending how deep you go. Um, and the reason this uh, matters is because when you have bubbles that are getting smaller, that means you can put more bubbles in a space. So basically, as the bubbles get smaller, you can shove more bubbles into that same space because uh, that pressure took the bubbles all down to a smaller size. I'm kind of <laughs> reiterating myself here, but um, that's kind of the the essential uh, physics behind uh, a lot of these uh, diving injuries we're going to see in a minute. So just keep this in mind. So the basic laws of diving. One, uh, pressure is transmitted across the body's air cavities, uh, causing compression of those air cavities. So lungs, middle ear, sinuses, gastrointestinal tract, gastro gastrointestinal tract, uh, and so on. Uh, two. As pressure increases with uh, descent into the water, uh, a gas bubble's volume decreases. And as pressure decreases with ascent, gas bubble expands. So this is kind of going to be the basics of the law of our, our uh, injury. Uh, number three, the total pressure of mixture of gases is equal to the sum of the partial pressure of the gases. Uh, this is mainly important for uh, those who are mixing uh, gas tanks. This isn't going to apply to most of you recreationally. Um, it's going to be more uh, applying to the companies who are supplying the gas tanks. Uh, and four, as a gas partial pressure increases with depth, more gas bubbles will be dissolved into the blood. So we kind of went over this. As the bubbles are getting smaller, you can shove more of those bubbles into the bloodstream. So why is all this important? We kind of went over the physics of everything. How does this apply to diving injuries? Well, the first and most common that everyone thinks of is decompression sickness. So this is when a diver who went down to a certain depth, uh, all those bubbles uh, uh, within their body, spe specifically nitrogen, what we're talking about, um, compresses, gets smaller and smaller. More of those bubbles are shoved into uh, different spaces, wh whether it be tissues, bloodstream, uh, uh, parenchymal tissue, brain, whatever. Um, and then they decide to suddenly surface, so they're going up way too quickly. Those bubbles don't have time to slowly diffuse out as they're getting bigger. Those bubbles uh, are still within that compressed space with all the bubbles shoved in, and then suddenly all the bubbles get bigger and cause uh, massive injury. So we're talking about nitrogen the most because this is the one that uh, goes from the largest size uh, to the smallest size compared to oxygen and carbon monoxide. It's the one that has the biggest uh, mass change. Um, and that's why when uh, you suddenly resurface and it goes from its compressed state to its expanded state, uh, it has the most uh, uh, mechanism of injury. So the types of injuries we're talking about is cellular distension. So you shoved a bunch of these bubbles in uh, uh, in a cell and it causes the cell to rupture. Mechanical stretching of the tendons and ligaments because of uh, bubbles trapped within those uh, spaces and suddenly expand. Uh, intravascular or intralymphatic occlusion. So you have bubbles suddenly occluding um, your uh, vascular system or lymphatic system. Uh, congestive ischemia or infarction, lymphedema, uh, activation of intrinsic clotting or uh, kinin and complement. So uh, these, kind, these bubbles are causing uh, activation of your clotting cascades and then also uh, causing uh, microvascular injury, uh, which can induce the clotting cascade again. Uh, and this can lead to platelet activation, lipid embolization, microvascular sludging, um, increased vascular permeability, and then also inter interstitial edema. So uh, why does this happen at certain depths and why does it happen at others? So this is a depth time profile for divers, basically telling them uh, how to resurface safely and the amount of time needed to uh, reacclimate and allow, and allow these gas bubbles to diffuse out as they're getting larger. So this one takes it uh, down to, uh, this one's uh, rated in feet uh, for all of us Americans here. Um, it, uh, this one profile takes it down to uh, 60 feet. So basically saying um, 
you need to do an ascent rate of one uh, one foot per minute, and then at every ATM that you uh, raise up, say you're at four ATM, you go to three ATM. When you go up to a, uh, uh, an increased ATM, then you're going to allow a certain amount of time to elapse. So there's different profiles of uh, your ascent rates and how long you have to stay at a certain ATM, uh, breathing uh, different mixtures of air versus oxygen. Um, Again, no one's going to be a professional diver after this uh, this uh, lecture. It's just meant to give you a kind of background imagery to figure out what's going on and how your patients got to the point of where they're at with you. Um, but again, you have to uh, regulate how quick uh, you ascend, uh, and you have to hang out uh, quite a while uh, different um, depths to make sure that you don't ascend too quickly. Uh, and you have to uh, calculate all of this into how long you have your oxygen tank for uh, and the depth you're diving uh, when you're uh, planning your dive. So very complicated. You need to take a dive course all on its own to make sure that you are well versed uh, in doing all this. That's why uh, the courses are so extensive and require you to do so many uh, dives before you can dive alone. Um, but kind of just moving on from there, just so you have an idea, uh, you also want to uh, make sure that uh, you're not flying right after diving. Uh, because, again, think about it this way. You went diving in Costa Rica and decided that, hey, I'm going to dive the day before I fly out or the same day I fly out. You're going from that depth to a 1 ATM. Uh, for atmospheric pressure. And then you're suddenly taking that atmospheric pressure of one ATM and making it a lot less as you get in plane and go uh, flying uh, back home. So you want to be super careful if you're going on a diving trip. Uh, put all of your diving activities towards the forefront of your trip uh, and have a couple of days, usually 48 hours is your safe bet uh, before you fly out uh, between diving. Um, this is just kind of a general profile of how long you should wait uh, from diving to flying, but uh, we'll kind of go over our, go over in a bit uh, on the next slide, actually, why 48 hours is the the golden time. So uh, decompression sickness. Uh, peop, uh, whoever it is did uh, not follow the proper procedure, uh, uh, rose up from a, a certain depth way too quickly, and now they're starting to get symptoms from that nitrogen uh, bubble damage. So symptoms uh, can occur. Um, from anywhere from uh, as soon as they surface uh, up to 48 hours. That's why I was saying that 48 hours is the sweet mark if you're flying back home. Um, usually, 60% uh, of cases usually occur within the first hour. Um, then it goes from 40% of cases within the first three hours, 98% of cases within six hours, uh, and then 100% uh, all the way to 48 hours. So the vast, vast majority happen within the first six hours, and then the majority happening within that first hour. Um, if they uh, rise up way too quickly um, from a uh, uh, quite a quite a deep uh, area, then they can actually uh, surface with symptoms. You can uh, you can pop a lung basically as you're coming up, and then we'll talk more about that in just a bit. Um, since bubbles can form in any part of the body, tissues, vascular spaces, lymphatic spaces uh, surrounding the brain, anywhere. Um, uh, or they can even migrate uh, from the bloodstream to any part of the body. Um, decompression sickness can provide a super wide range of symptoms. Um, effects can vary from joint pain and skin rashes all the way to paralysis and even death. So some thing, so if you have a buddy who's coming up from a dive and just acting not normal or has any kind of complaint, uh, kind of just thinking, hey, this person might have decompression sickness and starting to question them, okay, how quickly did you rise up? Uh, did you time everything appropriately? You know, what's going, what's going on here? Uh, some things you can be looking for is unusual fatigue, which, you know, is a weird one because I don't know about you guys, but whenever I go on long swims or anything, I'm exhausted. So I don't know if unusual fatigue is a uh, really great in a clinical setting. Um, skin itching, uh, from uh, those micro bubbles within the dermis, uh, arm pain, dizziness, vertigo, ten tinnitus, uh, numbness, tingling, paralysis, shortness of breath, blotchy rash is super common. Um, uh, difficulty urinating, confusion is super common. So any kind of altered mental status, uh, tremors, staggering, anything that is uh, out of the ordinary, basically. So 
musculoskeletal uh, system is the most affected um, with decompression sickness or the bends. Uh, it encompasses 70% of cases. It can involve any joint, uh, but the shoulders and elbows are most common. And this is usually a, a boring, deep, dull ache. So this is when you get a nitrogen bubble stuck in, in your joint spaces, and it's causing quite a lot of pain. Uh, you can also get uh, spinal cord involvement. Um, so it's common in divers who are uh, also aviation personnel, uh, or you suddenly uh, go up in altitude from a plane or something. Um, and it usually encompasses the lower thoracic uh, to lumbosacral se segments, starting insidiously as back pain and then progressing to paresthesia, paralysis as they ascend uh, an altitude. And it's from um, uh, bubbles forming either in... Um, and uh, spaces where uh, nerves are exiting uh, the spinal column or from forming in that dural sheath or from forming in uh, those spinal arteries and causing ischemia. So any of those things can lead to spinal cord injury. Um, skin rash, uh, usually found on the torso. Um, it can be found on the chest, belly, back, shoulders, anywhere there. It uh, can be find, found on the arms, buttocks. Basically, you find it anywhere. And it's very... Um, it's very specific. Uh, it looks kind of a, a marbled, uh, and it's called uh, cutis marmorata, and it's there in the buffed picture on the right. Uh, it's uh, a little bit like a sunburn, but uh, a lot more patchy. Um, and usually they're itchy as well, because again, you get all these bubbles forming within the dermis, and it's causing a lot of irritation. So decompression sickness um, most uh, commonly occurs in divers uh, or underwater bridge workers. Again, if you can have diving uh, not at sea level as well. So underwater bridge workers, you can have uh, lake divers uh, and all that sort of stuff as well. So you don't wanna just uh, hone in on uh, oceans and that sort of activity and have that as your idea. Um, can also occur in flying in unpressurized aircrafts uh, and then extravehicular activity uh, from spacecrafts as well. So I doubt you guys will be treating any astronauts, but that's something to just kind of keep in head. Um, flying after diving is uh, an undisputed cause for decompression illness. So even someone who within those, uh, those first couple hours totally fine after diving, they hop in a plane and then suddenly uh, lower the atmospheric pressure around them even further, then they start getting a lot of the symptoms. That, so that's kind of common. Um, uh, other factors that kind of put you at risk for getting decompression sickness uh, include obesity, dehydration, uh, advanced age, and cold exposure as well. So the treatment uh, is uh, a couple of things. Um, basically, you might have in your head, hey, uh, my buddy just surfaced. He's showing symptoms. Maybe he should go back down and then uh, re-pressurize re, uh, and then come up slowly. Bad, bad, bad idea. Because if you uh, remember, a lot of the uh, symptoms we went over were neurologic symptoms. So a lot of these patients uh, eventually progress to ultramenous status. If they have a gas embolism that travels to their brain, they can have a stroke. You don't want any of this to happen while they are uh, diving underwater because then suddenly they're going to drown because they, they are uh, either altered or no longer cognizant. So you do never want to send someone um, uh, back, to a, uh, back to a certain depth to... to um, uh, reacclimate. Uh, what you do want to do is you want to get oxygen on them. So you want to uh, uh, try and reoxygenate them uh, as best as you can. You also want to uh, lay them on their uh, back uh, and have their feet uh, above their head, basically. Um, so what you're trying to do is get a slant where their head is lower than their body so that any bubbles uh, go towards their feet and not towards their head. Um, and uh, once you uh, suspect uh, decompression sickness in any individual, you need to book it back to uh, shore and then get them to a hospital to uh, be admitted to a uh, treatment facility with a hyperbaric chamber. Anywhere at sea level uh, that's common for recreational activities or any uh, place with a wound care facility should have a um, hyperbaric uh, treatment facility where they can repressurize the individual uh, and, and slowly uh, bring them uh, out from that pressure. And so what you're doing is you're trying to get those gas bubbles to recompress down uh, and, and stop causing injury and then slowly allow them to diffuse out as you slowly uh, decrease the pressure and allow them to expand.
Okay, so that kind of goes over the big things for decompressant sickness. Let's talk about some of the other things you can get. So I was saying earlier how uh, you can get symptoms as soon as you surface, if you uh, surface too quickly. And that's kind of some of the more uh, dire things we're gonna talk about right now. Um, so we're gonna start with uh, medial sinal uh, or subcutaneous emphysema. Um, you can also get a pneumothorax and then uh, gas embolism. So these are the three uh, big things that can happen that can uh, be perilous. So starting with uh, mediastinal emphysema, um, it's the most common form of pulmonary overpressure syndrome, POPs. And what POPs does is it literally pops, pops popping the alveoli because of the gas uh, pressure sudden increase, uh, and then popping through uh, those visceral membranes into uh, the mediastinal space. Air dissects along the periodoscular sheath and bronchi into the mediastinum. Um, this condition uh, can be asymptomatic, uh, but it usually presents with uh, a deep sub substernal chest pain. You may be thinking, oh, this person's having a heart attack, but then you start palpating along their chest and you start hearing crackles as you're palpating, and that's the air bubbles uh, moving through um, uh, that subcutaneous uh, area. Um, you may also hear crackles when you're listening to um, the mediastinum uh, with a stethoscope. Uh, dyspnea is not always present, but uh, in severe cases, cases, it usually is. Hoarseness, not able to fully present uh, if air dissects from the mediastinum into the neck. Uh, but yeah, if you have air bubbles moving up into the neck, you can uh, start getting a, a lot of that hoarse voice, you can start uh, putting uh, compression on the carotid order, uh, artery uh, or uh, the jugular vein, so you can cause some cerebral edema with that. Uh, all of these are very serious issues, and you want to have this person uh, evaluated and treated as soon as possible. Uh, radiographs will usually uh, confirm the diagnosis, so just ordering a plain chest x-ray as soon as you get to the ED, which is uh, pretty uh, standard treatment. Um, and uh, the treatment is conservative uh, using uh, an oxygen mask and trying to, again, keep their head uh, below their body so it, uh, the bubbles are not moving further up the carotid sheath and then putting compression. Okay, so the next big one is, okay, so we talked about POPs, uh, 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 gas bubbles uh, increasing in size, suddenly popping alveoli, moving uh, past the viscera into the perivascular space. What if it bursts completely through the viscera into the pleural space? And this is what happens with the pneumothorax, rupture, uh, through, rupture through the visceral pleura and accumulation of air into the pleural space. Um, it's uh, less common because the visceral pleura is stronger than the pulmonary interstitial uh, areas, so you can get uh, air bubbles going up through the perivascular sheath a lot easier than you can straight through the uh, visceral pleura into the pleural space. Um, but uh, it can happen, and uh, signs and symptoms include pleuritic chest pain, dyspnea, decreased breath sounds on that affected side. So basically, you're getting a buildup of air surrounding that lung, compressing that lung, and so they're not able to properly oxygenate. Um, the treatment is the same uh, for as a pneumothorax of any cause, so it's uh, uh, a needle decompression in the um, the uh, second uh, intercostal space above that lung, uh, and then uh, draining of that air. Again, this needs to be performed either uh, by someone trained uh, to do it with the proper equipment or in the ED. Um, but again, this is uh, a serious complication that can lead to uh, severe hypoxemia in these individuals. So the most feared compl complication of uh, of sudden decompression um, when diving, I would say is um, arterial gas embolism. So this is when you have uh, a bunch of nitrogen bubbles within the bloodstream, and then one of these bubbles becomes large enough to cause an occlusion. And then these bubbles can also travel along the artery and cause occlusion of certain uh, areas. And the one we're most worried about, again, would be uh, causing occlusion within the cerebral arteries or veins. Um, this is a very serious complication because it can lead a person to stroking out. So, arterial gas embolisms. They're the most common cause of death and disability among sports diver. Um, it typically develops during ascent or it may develop up to 10 minutes after surfacing. So that first 10 minutes is something you really wanna be keen on uh, evaluating people surfacing from dives, especially if they surface too quickly. Uh, arterial gas embolisms result from air bubbles entering the pulmonary uh, venous system from a ruptured uh, alveoli. These bubbles then uh, migrate via the left atrium into the left ventricular uh, 
uh, vent, left ventricle, aorta, and arterial system, and then um, shower distally and can uh, obstruct blood flow in the distal vessels, either going up the ascending aorta or descending aorta. So you can get a myriad of multifocal and deadly um, uh, distribution of symptoms. Um, the uh, foremost being uh, an ischemic stroke. So a bubble goes up the uh, Ascending aorta goes to the brain uh, and uh, then causes an ischemic stroke. Uh, retrochiasmal defects such as uh, hemianopsias and cortical blindness super common. So if you get uh, occlusion of um, of the uh, occipital lobe of the brain, um, getting uh, giving cortical blindness. Uh, you can also get central retinal artery occlusion, so you can have uh, sudden uh, pain in the eye or loss of vision. Um, and then all of these are we're talking about is more kind of the head related, but again, you can get occlusion distally as well. So you can get uh, sudden uh, mesenteric pain from mesenteric ischemia or basically anywhere uh, one of those bubbles can travel and cause ischemic damage. Um, so any uh, symptoms, especially sudden loss of consciousness, altered mental status, any of those things uh, occurring uh, immediately to a diver upon surfacing, you have to say that, hey, this is an arterial gas embolism unless it's proven otherwise and you prove otherwise by getting treatment in an emergency room and, and making sure that it's, it's not the aforementioned thing. Um, so what do you do? Um, urgent cre recompression is the immediate treatment. You want to get these people to a hyperbaric facility as soon as possible. So you are booking it back to shore and you want to get them uh, treated as soon as possible. You're calling shore saying what's going on. Hey, I have a person here who needs immediate attention. They've been diving uh, and they suddenly came up and they were having all these symptoms and uh, go from there. Um, recompression is meant to, again, uh, reduce the bubble diameter volume and allowing return of um, uh, circulation to that part of the body. Um, but what you do in the meantime on the boat, uh, on the beach, wherever, is you get an oxygen mask on them, you're re-oxygenating them, and then you, again, you get the body low, you're, sorry, you get the head lower than the rest of the body, especially the legs. Uh, you, again, bu bubbles travel the way in the body the same way they do in regular air, as they, uh, they travel upward to get the least amount of resistance. So they, if you uh, put the head lower than the rest of the body, those airs are, the air bubbles are going to be less likely to go through uh, the ascending aorta, uh, and they're more likely to be uh, shoved towards the descending aorta and to go to the rest of the, uh, the body and the circulatory system rather than to the brain. So that's something you really want to uh, keep in mind. Um, lidocaine uh, is pretty controversial. It's not really given anymore um, because it has limited data for its effectiveness. Uh, and it uh, we have all this data uh, on giving lidocaine inducing um, cardiac arrhythmia. So basically uh, it might be helpful, but it's, it's more likely to cause problems. So basically I would stay away from uh, any kind of lidocaine treatments, just stick with oxygen positioning. Okay, that kind of goes over all the big ones. Uh, let's talk about some of the, uh, the other stuff you can get with diving. Um, something some of you may have heard is uh, nitrogen, ni nitrogen narcosis, or the rapture of the deep. Um, a lot of uh, fantasy novels, artists, uh, uh, old divers, and that sort of thing, uh, accounts of mermaids being seen, all this. A lot of this is referring to rapture of the deep, or the narcs. So this is uh, induced by an increased partial pressure of nitrogen uh, and compressed air, which dissolves into tissues at increased depth. So basically, uh, nitrogen uh, go is lipid permeable, is shoved further and further into tissues the deeper you go. Eventually, you get this crossing the neuronal membranes, um, and this causes uh, an effect on the brain. It causes uh, anesthetic-like euphoria, overconfidence, and diminished judgment. None of the things that are, are good when you're diving. Um, especially when you have to be regulating equipment, making sure you're uh, resurfacing at a proper ratio, just all of these things. Uh, nitrogen narcosis can be quite serious and cause serious effort, uh, errors in diving techniques and causing accidents and uh, eventual drowning. Um, it's more common in non-recreational diving uh, below 40 meters. So less common in recreational divers uh, unless you're you're trying to do deep dives which the 40 meters uh is very very deep so uh i, I believe 132 feet uh so you really shouldn't be going down that far just for re recreational diving so nitrogen narcosis um 
the symptoms start occurring somewhere around uh, 70 feet usually. You start with lightheadedness, loss of sensory discrimination, giddiness, euphoria. Then as you're uh, getting even deeper, uh, you're getting uh, increased poor judgment, uh, impaired reasoning, overconfidence, slowing of your reflexes. As you get even deeper, auditory visual hallucination, so seeing mermaids. Um, uh, feelings of uh, impending blackout start occurring, and then you can eventually even lose consciousness and drown. Okay, so best way to prevent this is avoiding deep, deep dives, okay? Uh, diving beyond 40 meters around 130 feet is typically outside the scope of uh, recreational diving. Um, the types of divers you do see doing this are military um, or underwater welders or construction workers. So that, those are the individuals who are usually doing these kind of deep, deep dives. Um, and they usually are provided special equipment to do so. This equipment is quite expensive. So uh, this is not something usually a recreational diver would have access to. Um, the the main way that uh, these uh, military or construction personnel um, prevent nitrogen narcosis is switching up the nitrogen in the tank to helium. Um, it's uh, called trimix or heliox. And uh, it's because helium it has low lipid solubility and so it's non-narcotic. It doesn't start giving you any of the uh, brain affects, the altered mental status or anything uh, like that. What it does give you is a really high pitched voice. So anybody uh, who had a childhood and you know got a, got a balloon with helium in it, breathed it in to change their voice, um, it can cause um, uh, you to have that really high pitched voice that uh, no one can understand. And it sounds like a cartoon baby voice. Um, so what they have actually is a little uh, device called a helium uh, descrambler that electronically lowers the pitch of the voice so uh, divers can con uh, continue to communicate with each other. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, treatment for nitrogen nar narcosis is uh, uh, kind of the same thing as uh, ascent to shallower depths to get uh, those nitrogen bubbles to slowly diffuse uh, out of the brain and lipid uh, layers. Again, you wanna do this slowly. It's the same kind of slow ascent that you have with everything else because you have nitrogen bubbles and brain parenchyma um, that suddenly expand and that's bad news bears. So slow ascent uh, once you start getting any kind of those uh, symptom, neurologic symptoms. Another thing we can talk about is oxygen to toxicity. So any too much of a good thing, basically. Um, high pressures of oxygen can actually be toxic. And it's not toxic so much that you get the altered mental status that we're talking about, nit nitrogen. This is more of forming free radicals causing tissue damage kind of toxicity. Um, pulmonary toxicity, so uh, tissue damage due to the formation of oxygen-free radicals is the most uh, common of oxygen toxicity. You can also get substernal chest discomfort comfort on inhalation that uh, progresses to burning pain, persistent coughing, a little similar to uh, medial stinal uh, emphysema as well that we we're talking about earlier. Um, you can also get CNS toxi toxicity, so uh, the oxidation of the enzyme, sy enzyme systems of these free radicals causing um, problems. You can also get um, twitching of facial muscles, hand muscles, loss of consciousness, and seizures. Uh, so this, again, is going to be at super, super deep dives, um, uh, kind of where you're getting the nitrogen toxicity as well, uh, but a little bit deeper. Um, and then it can uh, cause some of these uh, symptoms. You're, again, not going to experience these with normal recreational diving less than 40 meters. Uh, but this is something to keep an eye out for uh, with any of your military construction personnel uh, who are diving. Okay. So some more common um, things that happen to divers. Mass squeeze um, is super common. Um, it's usually when someone doesn't know how to uh, properly aerate their mask while they're diving. It happens during descent as the ambient pressure increases, volume of air within the mask decreases and causes a, a severe suctioning of the mask. Um, uh, mask uh, pressure equilibrium is maintained by nasal exhalation during the descent. So if someone isn't properly breathing out their nose as they're descending, uh, creating more gas, uh, gas bubbles from their air tank in their mask to uh, uh, equilibrate that air, uh, if they're not doing this, and they're uh, going to just keep getting uh, uh, increased, increased suction of that mask, which then can lead to a uh, rupture of the capillaries within the surrounding skin of the eyes, and then also uh, subconjunctival uh, hemorrhages, lid edema, and rarely uh, hyphema as well. Um, 
these symptoms are can be quite painful and you get the uh, capillary fatigue rash. Uh, you can also get, uh, again, that subconjun subconjunctival hemorrhage where you get um, blood flowing and uh, all the all of the sclera and it can look quite bad, but usually uh, it'll resolve over several days to a week without any further treatment. And you can just use some cold compresses and analgesics um, uh, for symptomatic treatment. You wanna make sure that you are not doing any more diving uh, until your symptoms are completely clear. You could cause some permanent damage. Uh, I would say the most common uh, thing you get with divers, even people diving in a swimming pool, is something called ear squeeze, which is baritidis media. Um, is basically you get uh, uh, the eustachian tube uh, uh, clamping down, closing off, and then uh, the increased pressure of the water around you pushes on the tympanic membrane, and it hurts. Uh, I, I This is pretty common for me, too, is when I'm diving is I forget to uh, uh, equal equilibrate my um, my ears and I end up getting uh, this ear pain as I'm diving further down. Um, it can happen as low as 2.5 feet underwater, um, which is about a 60 uh, millimeter mercury pressure gradient, uh, gradient against the eardrum once that eustachian tier, tube uh, closes down. You get a slight pain from the stretching and inward bulging of the tympanic membrane. Um, four feet uh, collapses the medial one third of the station tube and, and causes that uh, pressure to uh, increase against the uh, the eardrum without uh, any kind of equal equilibrization, that, that big word. <laughs> um, and then greater than four feet, if you don't uh, keep your eustachian tubes open, it can cause tympanic membrane rupture, uh, which, oh, you suddenly have a relief of the pain, um, but then you start getting a lot of nausea, tinnitus, vertigo, um, because you have all this cold water rushing into the middle ear. Um, and that can actually uh, also cause polymicrobial infections. So that's why you get um, uh, ear infections uh, so easily in young children um, when they're playing in water activities. So um, to prevent this, basically, um, you start immediately upon leaving the surface of the water and you do frequent equalization maneuvers. So basically, it's the same thing as when you are uh, popping your ears when you're on a plane or driving in the mountains or something like that, is you hold your nose, close your eyes, and then you uh, breathe uh, out against uh, your lips closed and basically you're causing uh, what feels like air going to your ears. What that uh, pop open sensation you feel is that eustachian tube popping back open. And you wanna do this several times as you dive down. Topical and oral decongestants may be used before diving to facilitate the equalization, but it can't uh, replace uh, uh, you doing the actual maneuver yourself. Um, and combining an oral decongestant with a long-acting uh, topical nasal spray for the first few days is quite effective as well uh, when you're doing dive trips. Any diver unable to equalize should not dive until they're able to do so. This is uh, super important and you need to make sure you're able to do this properly before you're diving to any type of depth because when you are no longer inhibited by inability to breathe for diving deep down, uh, you will dive uh, past the depth your tympanic membranes can take if you don't have an open eustachian tube and you will end up uh, rupturing your tympanic membrane. So you gotta make sure you practice this and you know how to do this before you go on any kind of diving trips. Some other kind of barotrauma, so barotrauma, uh, including sinus squeeze, is basically, we talked about air being compressible uh, in any kind of cavity that has air, whether it be sinuses, uh, your lungs, your gastrointestinal tract, those areas can be affected. Uh, so sinus squeeze is inability to equalize air pressure in any of the paranasal sinuses. Um, and the relative negative pressure causes mucosal congestion, edema, hemorrhage, all along with severe pain. Um, uh, other injuries can include labyrinthine injuries, uh, so an overly forceful Vesalva maneuver or very rapid descent uh, may lead to permanent deafness or vestibular dysfunction, so you want to be really careful. Um, you usually get a class of triad of symptoms including uh, roaring tinnitus, so a roaring sound in your ears, vertigo, and hearing loss all at the same time. Um, treatment includes bed rest with uh, head elevated to 30 degrees and avoiding strenuous act uh, activity. You don't want any more uh, kind of the Sava activity, increasing internal pressure, straining, or uh, and then you just use symptomatic uh, therapy from there on out. Any suspected uh, inner ear barotrauma should be evaluated by ENT ASAP. This also includes if you suspect um, tympanic membrane rupture. 
Okay. Uh, our last slide is talking about pulmonary barotrauma. So we went over this a little bit earlier, but uh, this is rising to the surface expansion injury. So you're suddenly rising so quickly, you get expansion of those gas bubbles, you cause rupture of the alveoli. Um, it most commonly occurs in divers with a history of rapid uncontrolled uh, ascent. Um, and gas in the lungs begins to expand with the ascent and the highest volume change uh, occurring at shallower depths. So basically that last um, 20, 30 meters is where you're gonna get uh, the most rapid change. Um, the diver uh, does not allow the uh, expanding gas to escape, um, basically because they dive too quickly. They don't allow it to slowly diffuse out as the gas bubbles get bigger. And then over distension and rupture of the alveoli uh, causes ex uh, extreme problems. So this, uh, again, uh, the rupture of the alveoli uh, destroys uh, space for uh, uh, air diffusion, or sorry, <laughs> uh, gas diffusion across that alveolar membrane. So uh, you're uh, decreasing uh, your areas for uh, gas diffusion. You can become hypoxemic, hypercapnic. Um, you can also uh, uh, pop a lung, basically. So you can get uh, atelectasis uh, and causing complete deflation of that lung as well. Uh, and the air can also escape into local tissues or even into systemic circulation. So we talked about the uh, air embolisms and all that jazz. All right, so this has just been a brief overview of diving medicine. Uh, again, this is not meant to uh, replace a diving course or uh, any kind of uh, professional training. So I definitely recommend you take those courses, but now you'll have an idea of what's going on uh, in the background. Um, all this stuff was taken from either our box wilderness medicine, uh, the AWLS uh, 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 University of Utah uh, 2020 manual. And then I also took a couple of things from the American Heart Association and uh, Swift Water Rescue Manual. So. Uh, that being said, if you have any questions, uh, stuff to update, corrections, anything along those lines, please either email me or leave it in the comments. And other than that, please check out the rest of these videos.